Thank you very much. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Fries and the organizers for inviting me, uh, everybody that's coming, especially the patients. And I feel very honored to speak after Jennifer. That, that was amazing. And, and that reminded me that's the reason I wake up every morning and go to work. Um, I wanted to give my disclosures as well. I'm not a neuromuscular specialist either. I'm actually a pediatrician and a geneticist, and I specialize in inborn nerves of metabolism, which, believe it or not, GNE myopathy is part of. And the reason I went this path is because since I was in medical school, I remember uh, my professors telling me that I didn't need to learn anything about rare diseases because I was very likely not going to see any during my practice. And I just, that struck me as the worst thing they could have told me. And that moment, uh, back then, rare diseases wasn't as popular as it is now. I decided that that's the path I was going to take in, in my career. And there's not a rare disease specialty. So this was the closest I could get. Uh, uh, but I am very, I am very um, uh, honored then to be part of a group at the NIH which is called the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases. And the goal of this group is specifically to do that, to find uh, and move forward therapies that have been shown in preclinical models that may be useful for patients with uh, both rare and also uh, neglected diseases, which are diseases that are more common, but uh, pharmaceuticals company wouldn't be interested um, because uh, patients do not have enough money to pay for those therapies. So what I'm going to talk about today is advancing MANAC as a therapy for uh, GNE myopathy and the, the efforts that we, we're doing at the NIH. Uh, a lot of my talk is, is going to have talk on, about MANAC, but uh, more than that, we are trying to build a base of knowledge, an infrastructure that will be able to be used with any therapy that's been tested in the future to, to, to find out whether, uh, to, to prove efficacy. So let me start by, and you're going to hear these multiple times, by talking a little bit about GNE myopathy. And I look at this as, a, as an inborn neurometabolism pathway because, as you can see, this is the biosynthetic pathway of sialic acid inside of your cells. So inside of your cells, there is a mechanism by which uh, de novo sialic acid is created. Um, and when you have a deficiency in the enzyme that catalyzes these two steps, the polymerase and the uh, UDP glucanac polymerase and MANAC kinase, uh, we know that um, that's caused by uh, mutations in the GNE gene, and that eventually, by a, by a mechanism that uh, that's not entirely sure, lead to, to progressive muscle weakness. We know there's a hypocyolation of muscle proteins, but the exact mechanism by what that, that leads to, progressive muscle weakness, is not very well known. What we do know is it's a disease that presents in young adults, and it's progressive, and leads to muscle weakness and atrophy, and that's a, a very rare disease. This is the gene. Uh, it's it's 13, it's, it's 13 exons long, and there are, muta there are more than 140 different um, changes known to date in this gene that are known to cause GNE myopathy. Now, you need to have two copies affected of the gene to manifest the disease. If you have one copy, then uh, you're a carrier. So the, the reason that we are testing uh, substrate therapies is because if we can restore this intracellular pathway of producing sialic acid, we think that we could increase the sialation of the proteins that are being, uh, that happen inside of the cell. And here is a picture of a, of a sialated uh, glycoprotein. Um, and, and there is some evidence that uh, has been published by our group that shows uh, methods that detect the degree of sialation in muscle. And we know the muscle of patients with GNE myopathy has decreased levels of sialic acid attached to their muscle protein compared to patients that do not have the disease. And that this somehow leads 
to the generation of uh, inclusions, vacuoles, and atrophy of the muscle. So when the enzyme is missing or has decreased activity, because in most cases it's a decreased activity rather than an, than an absence, we think that the sialic acid as well as the sialation of those proteins are decreased. And that if we get back uh, the substrate, whether it's MANAC or sialic <coughs> acid, that we'll be able to restore this pathway. Now, you notice here that MANAC is above this step that it's also affected in GNE myopathy. And we have some very good evidence to show that, um, that MANAC is also, uh, may be also useful in patients that have uh, changes on the kinase domain of the gene. Uh, basically because this UDP glucnac epimerase is a very specific enzyme, very specialized, specialized enzyme, and that function could not be easily performed by a different enzyme, but there's, there's been theories that the MANAC kinase function could be, easy, could be performed by other less specific kinases that are inside of the cell. Um, this, I'm not going to go a lot into the preclinical evidence. After me, it's going to be Dr. Malignan talking about this, and this is her uh, slide that she graciously gave us. But this is the preclinical data that has been generated on MANAC on the mouse model. And based on that uh, uh, very promising preclinical data is that uh, this project was decided to go forward uh, to, to, to treat um, to try in patients. Now you can see this is a little timeline uh, where the gene was discovered back in 2001, uh, conferences to try to raise awareness with HIBM. The mouse model was generated in 2004. And then uh, around 2006, it was um, the preclinical eff effects of um, um, MANAC and sialic acid were published. And very quickly after that, it, a, a trial was attempted, but put in clinical hold by the FDA, basically because there wasn't, there were several things that needed to be addressed, and that usually requires a, a lot of money. So, um, Trend took this project as one of their pilot projects in 2010, uh, after three years, to be in what it's called uh, the Valley of Death, which is promising therapies that do not make it to patients because there's not enough funding or resources to, to bring them forward. Uh, what Trend did, which is, again, the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases at NIH, is there were preclinical studies that were needed, including the, the toxicology studies that Ed was mentioning, as well as develop methods to actually measure the blood levels of MANAC in the blood were needed as well as making sure that the, the drug product was of a pharmaceutical grade. And there were many different uh, interactions with the FDA to get this through. And the costs just for these are estimated to be above uh, $2 million, but then there are other costs that have happened since then. So back when this project was taken up by Trend, uh, the knowledge was that there were potential therapies uh, in the preclinical models, but there was insufficient knowledge to plan clinical trials. Very limited knowledge about the progression of the disease. So if you're trying to change the progression, you first need to understand what you're changing. And all we knew were the general manifest clinical manifestations of the disease. Very, and these will also help you plan your length of clinical trials. There was also, and, and how often you measure the, the, the outcomes. There was there was, and there still is, a, a great challenge with a, a diagnosis, um, and a, there were no biomarkers, and very limited information to choose what measures to use for outcome. Um, so while the project has been in trend, I should say this is a collaborative project between NHGRI, which, is, uh, which did a lot of the preclinical studies, uh, Trend, which is also part of NIH, just part of a different institute, and New Zealand Pharmaceuticals, who is manufacturing, which one of the, the only company uh, that, that knows how to 
that manufactures MANAC. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the natural history study because I think every single clinical development plan is, is, is based on, on, a, on a thorough knowledge of the natural history. Uh, so we've started this in 2011, and what this is is a longitudinal prospective single center study that's at the NIH Clinical Center in patients with confirmed changes in the GNE gene and that are not taking uh, any substances that may alter the natural history of the disease. And the objectives are to identify or validate or generate uh, outcome measures that make sense, biomarkers, and to determine uh, the, the disease progression. So this is where uh, the National NIH Clinical Center is. It's 10 miles from uh, downtown DC. Uh, it does only research studies, and, and, and this is, we've increased the number of patients that we've seen and, and since 2011, and uh, we are very thankful for our patients that give their time and volunteer to perform all of these studies. Uh, we hope that as much as we're learning from them, hopefully they're, they're learning from us um, when they come. Our patients come from all over the world, so it's a very diverse cohort. And it is not just culturally diverse, it's also genetically diverse, uh, where uh, most of the mutations in the GNE gene are, uh, are varied. And this is how a typical uh, week looks like. They, people may get admitted on a, a Sunday night, and there's a series of evaluations that happen over the period of, of days with the purpose of, of looking at, um, at the disease from different point of views, not just the strength and the functional uh, impairments, but also how does that affect uh, the quality of life of the patients and their caregivers, and to try to provide uh, a lot of it is testing, but also provide evaluations with the hope that there could be some management suggestions um, at, the, at the end of the, of the visit. Um, common presenting symptoms, abnormal gait, fruit drop, tripping, falls, for people that perform sports, difficulty with sports, um, climbing steps. And, and this, to me, is an incredibly difficult image to look at because this is how the disease looks like by, by muscle MRI at the beginning of the disease, where uh, the dark is muscle and the, and the white is uh, fatty tissue. Uh, here, that's the section of at the level of the thigh. In the front, you can see the quadriceps and on the back of the hamstrings. You can also he see here the lower, uh, uh, the lower leg muscles as well as core muscles. Um, and over the co course of many years, and this is a, a very slowly progressive disease, which is good for patients, but complicates the design of clinical trials, uh, this from here may take several decades. And so you can see how the muscles get subsequently affected uh, over time. Uh, and I know this has been called this quadriceps sparing myopathy, but we actually, ultimately, the quadriceps may be, uh, may be affected as well, as you can see here. So when we go and plan cl clinical trials, uh, what we want to do is find a measure to measure efficacy that will be applicable uh, for, a, for a wide variety of, of different severities in patients. Uh, and like Ed was saying, I don't think there is an expectation that with substrate therapy we're going to be targeting this, this, this tissue. But that there, in, in, in advanced stages of the diseases, there is still muscle to be, to be targeted and making sure that our measure is not ex it's inclu as inclusive as possible to the whole range of the disease. Um, we have, under, as, as you've heard, there are many, there are differences in the speed at which different patients progress, and we're trying to understand what are those factors that affect progression. And, um, and, and before I go into the clinical trials, just to talk about this is a real issue right now that we're still dealing with if there are 
potential therapies to be moved forward for the disease, we really need to make sure that most patients get diagnosed. This is just to give you an idea of patients that have come to the NIH, the different diagnoses that they've received before getting a diagnosis of DNA myopathy. Charcot-Marie tooth, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, spinal muscle atrophy, Pompe disease, ALS, multiple sclerosis. Some people have even been treated with steroids because they were thought to have an inflammatory myopathy. And, and, some, so, and the mean diagnostic delay in our cohort is around 20 years, but we've seen patients that have told us that it took them 35 years to arrive to a diagnosis. Um, and so we went back into the literature and look, what is the real frequency of GNE myopathy? Because what we're looking at are only those patients that have been diagnosed. So we know it's a rare disease, but how rare is it truly is? And uh, I don't know if you've heard the, the, the recent uh, news from the White House about uh, sequencing whole genomes in, in patients, not, not in patients, but in, in, in people to understand uh, better their contributions to, to health. But there are already some of those databases that have sequenced uh, patients, uh, and there's a whole genetic sequencing data available. And we went into those databases and tried to find out based on the carrier frequency. So those patients in the database, or those people in the database that had one change in the GNE, basically, that they were carriers, they, we could have that number, which is right here, the carrier rate in that particular database, and there is a calculation on what the predicted prevalence would be. And we actually realized that there was variable among um, different databases, so as high as uh, 21 per million compared to one in a million than we thought before, to six in a million. So we basically estimated the prevalence to be one in 160,000, so six times more common than we previously thought. And that actually predicts the existence of at least 40,000 people with GNE myopathy, and of those, we estimate that 30,000 are not diagnosed. Um, now, moving from that, I'm going to start talking about our studies with, uh, with MANAC. And I wanted to mention that the MANAC is manufactured by New Zealand Pharmaceuticals, which um, it's also related to Dextra, and you saw some of the pamphlets out there. And basically what they do is they, uh, they produce sugars from different, for different purposes, for different reasons. And back at the time where the, where, where the researchers wanted to try MANAC in the mouse model, they reached out to them to be able to get the, the product because they couldn't find it anywhere else. And it turned out that now they, will, they are the, 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 the group that is uh, giving the, the MANAC for our trials. So MANAC, which is also called as n acetyl d manosamine, is a mildly sweet, highly water-soluble, neutral, rare sugar, and that is essential in metabolism, and that is the first committed precursor to sialic acids, as, as we showed you. And, uh, and because it's uncharged, it's expected to pass passively through membranes, including cell membranes. And these slides are courtesy of Selwyn York at New Zealand Pharmaceuticals. And NCP has been involved by manufacturing since 2013. They have a GMP compliant facility. That means this is very, uh, there was a lot of quality standards when this manac is made and uh, they can perform it in a large scale. So with all of this in place, we, after getting off from a clinical hold, having um, a method to detect MANAC, as well as uh, a product to give to patients, we started the phase <coughs> one trial, which was a single ascending dose study of MANAC at the NIH in 2012. This was a first in human study, and it was a randomized placebo control double-blind scalating, and we tested three doses, three, six, and ten, and for each cohort, six people received MANAC and two others received placebo, and the method to measure both MANAC and sialic acid in plasma had already been validated. Uh, what we found was, first, that after a single dose, MANAC was safe and well-tolerated. 
There were only grade one or two adverse events, which were in more increased in the MANAC versus the placebo group. But we did find that uh, half of the patients that received 10 grams of MANAC, this is why after he got them blinded, actually uh, had an episode of, uh, of loose tools that it was very suggestive of an increased, um, of, uh, of a decreased absorption of the MANAC. Um, and it was not reported at lower doses or as placebo, and it got resolved after a single episode with no other uh, complications. And that also went along to how, um, to, to let us know that was a dose that we will likely not move forward. So um, in terms of the pharmacokinetics, we, uh, this is a very difficult graph to look at. This is the way pharmacokineticists look at this. But basically, we, we saw what we already expected, that MANAC has a very short half-life, and it got excreted pretty quickly from the body. It was completely gone by 10 hours after the ingestion, and that's what we expected. That's what uh, the similar pattern as the sialic acid. But one of the things that we weren't expecting and that we were really impressed to see is that after receiving um, the MANAC, a single dose, there were persistent elevations on the of the plasma levels of sialic acid. Uh, and I want to show you this slide because I want to remind you that, that this process happens inside of the cells. And so that if we are if we are seeing sialic acid in the, in the blood, the explanation that we, could, that we gave was that reintroducing the MANAC uh, and giving MANAC to patients with GNE myopathy actually restored the intracellular pathway. And that led for us sampling um, increased levels of sialic acid in the blood. Uh, so that the, we will expect the concentrations to at least be equal or higher inside of the cells. And this is where we want, this is where the site of, this is the target site for our effect, because what we are trying to do is increase the sialations of proteins at this level, because proteins cannot be sialated once they're extracellular, they need to be sialated, or at least we think they need to be sialated at the time they're being uh, generated in the Golgi inside of the cell. So this is where we need to have our, our levels. So by seeing this increase in the plasma, we, 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 we could tell several things. First, not only that the MANAC had been absorbed, but that it had crossed through the membrane inside of the cell and restored this pathway where sialic acid was increased. And then uh, we could sample that in the plasma. I wanted to show you this as well because there has been a long-standing question whether if we're giving MANAC and MANAC kinases down here, whether it's true that non-specific kinases may phosphorylate that MANAC to continue the pathway. And, and we looked back at our patients that had uh, kinase-kinase mutations and looked to see whether there was any difference in their maximum values in the blood of sialic acid compared to the whole cohort of all different uh, types of mutations combined. And we realized that, the, that there are no uh, significant changes, that pa those patients with kinase-kinase mutations also produce levels of sialic acid after a single dose of MANAC, uh, comparable to those that have other uh, type of mutations. And that was seen both on the maximal concentrations as well as on the area under the curve. So our summary after the phase one, and we gave a single dose, but I think we learned a lot, that single doses of MANAC are safe and well tolerated, that 10 grams is likely not to be, a, as a single dose, will not be a, a, a dose that we move forward, uh, that we have a lot of evidence to think that a single dose of MANAC restores the production of sialic acid, um, and also in patients with kinase kinase mutations, and that that restoration after a single dose can last as long as 48 hours. And these allowed us to pick our dose to move forward um, between three to six grams twice daily for a total of six, between six and 12 grams daily. So we, built, we put our first building block when it comes to, to advancing MANAC. And then we, are, we have already, we are already started the open label study for MANAC for GN myopathy. We are screening patients 
And this, again, is a phase two open label single center study. And our purpose would be to um, assess safety and tolerability and pharmacokinetics of multiple doses, as well as assess the question is increasing the levels of restoring this pathway and increasing the, the, the sialic acid levels, is that re leading to increase of sialations at the level where it's needed, which is the muscle? Are we resilating the muscle proteins? And, um, and to do that, we, we wanna, we, we're going to take a small group of patients. We want to avoid performing biopsies on a lot of patients, and we do not want to delay the start of efficacy trials. So we will administer MANAC orally to 12 patients for 90 days, and they would have muscle biopsies before and after. And, and for this, um, this is a picture of how our, our study design looks like. Uh, there will also be pharmacokinetics and other evaluations being performed. Uh, but the main purpose, as I said, is pharmacokinetics and increase of uh, sialation in the muscle. To be able to determine that, there has been a method that has been generated and it's, and it's being validated to measure the difference in sialation uh, in muscles. And this is a lectin staining, and uh, this is the slide courtesy of uh, Marianne Heising, which has been working very hard to, to make this uh, happen. And Dr. Malignan, which is actually here, will talking to you as to validating it so that we can, uh, with the most sensitivity possible, semi-quantify or quantify this degree of sialation. And this is a tool that needed to be generated for us to be able to answer this question that wasn't available before. Um, so what we plan on doing on the phase two open label is know the safety of multiple doses and knowing whether MANAC can increase or restore the sialation of proteins. And we will also measure effects on some biomarkers that we are developing so that in, when, when we are expecting in, in 2016 a multicenter study, that the purpose of this study will be to show that, to prove whether or not MANAC slows or halts the progression of muscle weakness. Um, to prepare for that trial, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done because, um, and that's already um, almost completed, to select <coughs> the appropriate outcome measure to be used for a trial is critical. There may be very useful therapies for a disease, but if you are not able to measure uh, the true effect, uh, I think that there, there are a couple of scenarios when you, when you do a clinical trial. One is that your therapy is not effective and you don't see a change, which is fine because then you go on and find something else. That your therapy is effective and that you're able to measure that change, which is what everybody wants, or that your therapy is effective but that your trial turns out to be a false negative because you chose the wrong design, the wrong length, or the wrong outcome measure. And that's really something that, that, that we are trying to avoid because we really want to make sure whether we get positive or negative changes that those are going to be real and that we are confident in them so that, that we convincingly show what effect it has. And for that, um, because the disease is so slow, um, it, it may take with current outcome measures that are out there, we have estimated that it may take up to a clinical trial length of 10 years with the current gold standard to determine efficacy. And we obviously for a rare disease with not a lot of um, financial support that, and clearly we cannot wait that long for the patients, we, we needed to generate something that was able to be sensitive and that we'd be able to give us results uh, in, a, in a shorter period of time that will, uh, and that would target patients at different stages of the disease. So um, that's where we're at. And I wanted to acknowledge everyone that has been um, part of, these, of this project, um, including John McHugh, which is right here, which, was, uh, which worked very hard to to, to bring this forward, as, as well as the researchers, um, the, the NIH, and in particularly to patients with GNE myopathy and their families for being so brave, for, for, for coming to our studies, for pushing us to be better every day. And this is not a picture of a patient with GNE myopathy, but 
apparently somehow it made it to the, our website when our phase two trial got published, so I just put that there. <laughs> but because I also think this is also about the families and the, and the people that, that share your lives with you. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Yes. Any question? In, uh, excuse me. In your natural history study, have you identified any um, genetic or chemical or biochemical um, <laughs> markers that are indicative of you know more or less progressive disease decline? Or is is there data out in the literature to indicate you know if you take patients who present similarly with the disease, how can you predict their their long term? Their progression. So that's one of the things we're very interested on. So there's very different answers to that question. First, you know, the most obvious is are there any genotype phenotype correlations? So right. does a different uh, different changes in the gene lead to different uh, progression? You know, how quickly the disease progresses, and it's very hard to tell at this point because there are not enough patients with one single genetic combination that we could make studies that are powered to answer that question. And it will likely take a long time, at least with current, uh, with the current technology that we have available to make that. Right. So there's no good genotype phenotype correlations. But furthermore, there are uh, family, family members with exact same genetic changes in the gene that, that may progress very differently from each other. So it's clearly not just the exact change in the gene, but maybe other genetic modifiers, the genetic makeup, or also many different uh, environmental modifiers. And when they were trying to ask, well, do we know if people with a certain diet do better than others? It's very hard to know because there's so many moving variables that uh, at least right now we don't have the numbers to, to determine that. Um, in a way that that will answer the question. Thank you. Yeah. Another question over here. You could think about the capacity from the to the area, the area to the arm. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. So by the way, I'm very proud of, because I actually did that, path, that pathway <laughs> on my computer in my free time. Uh, we we have not seen and I don't think people have looked to see if if patients that have similar characteristics would have these these uh, that are negative for GNE myopathy would have those changes. I think there's there's always multiple levels. I think that maybe Dr. Fries will have okay, something to say. Well, I mean, I think you know the point is that that's one we know to to look for. Your point is there should be other ones in there, mm -hmm. and probably as pe more people are are exposed to whole exome sequencing, precision medicine, and all that. If there are those kinds of mutations, uh, they're going to pop up at some point, and you know you would have a predictable phenotype so far. And also, you should know the gene. It's normal gene now, the size of this gene. If the mutation is random, the frequency you should be able to predict in the population. What's mm -hmm. the predictive expected? Yeah. So you that, that kind of a couple of things is like. Now, mm -hmm. From 60 to 90, from 90. Yeah, right. right. So yeah. this is the rate limiting enzyme in the whole pathway. And, and that. Right. Correct. But then this is, this actually I didn't draw this, but this has negative feedback, feedback inhibition on UDP glucanac epimerase so that if you were producing more sialic acid, it will signal the, the enzyme to produce less sialic acid. But if there was not enough being produced, 
maybe uh, it they would increase the production to a level that can compensate for those, but that has not been studied. This grant is for normal people, mm -hmm. not for people who are decent to have Mike, yeah. you want to follow so, that up? I want to follow up on that. Um, uh, so, because one, just not get those enzymes in life if you get to eat. Right. Um, two, you know, so one of the issues here is that is, um, the GNE mutation is not only necessarily going to reduce sialic acid, it may raise your lipid levels in mm -hmm. the muscle. I don't know if anyone's right. looked at that. Um, and but we know that if you raise your lipid levels, you can do things to other sugars. Right. Um, and so I wonder if anyone's thought along that those lines. Um, looked at it. I think that not to to the point where something has been proven. Uh, talking about other diseases in the pathway, there is a CMP sialic acid transporter that has been associated with disease, and the phenotype is very different from this. It has a severe uh, phenotype in children that includes other um, systems other than the muscle, including uh, severe developmental delay. And, uh, just one final question, we're going to have to move on. You know, in the uh, uh, study where you showed that you put in MANNAC and out comes sialic acid, do you know that, in fact, it is the MANNAC that's actually converted to sialic acid, or could MANNAC be doing something else, as Mike suggested, playing around inside the cell and actually accelerating the degradation of silated proteins, and now that's what you're starting to see on the outside? So we're trying, we will, um, we're in the process of, we have validated uh, some other uh, things that we can measure that will answer that question uh, downstream on the, of the pathway, and that we will study that after administering MANAC to specifically answer uh, the question whether truly this is what's happening at the level of the cell. So if you had C13 labeled MANAC and put that in, then you'd be able to pull out C13 labeled sialic acid and know that that was the origin. And that's a, a study that we're, we've, we've planned but has not been. She set me up for this. <laughs> no, he set me up for this. Okay, we're going okay. to have to move along. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>